there, there are several um, strengthening mechanisms, in, um, in particular in ferritic steels, which we discussed in, in some more detail. Um, what um, you'll, you'll see, however, in, in many steels is that very often they have um, their multi-component, multi-phase microstructures. And, um, and so um, there are additional aspects to the, the strength of these microstructures. So one of the um, important uh, microstructures um, is traditionally, I have to say, is the um, constituent called perlite, which, which you uh, probably know from your undergraduate years already, which consists of this, this uh, lamellar um, microstructure of alternating ferrite and perlite. And there are two, in the strength aspects of this microstructure, there are two important things. Um, that is the interlamellar spacing, yes? And then what we call the, the size of the perlite colonies. You, you can see here that you've got uh, parallel um, uh, lats, lamellus, uh, and, and that there are boundaries between different regions. Well, these regions uh, we call perlite colonies. And the uh, uh, most important aspect of the uh, the, the strength of this perlite appears to be related to the interlamellar uh, spacing. That's the interlamellar spacing. And you, you can see that if you plot the, the yield strength of um, perlitic steels, various perlitic steels, you find a, a whole patch type of relationship between the strength and the inverse of the square root, yes? And that's very clear here. And it, it's for the different perlitic steels, some that are fully perlitic. Hmm? Uh, for instance, here, this is a real perlitic steel, which, which would look like, like this, basically. And then we have these hyper-eutectoid, uh, really high carbon um, uh, steels with uh, high levels of, much higher levels of carbon. So you get an increase in the strength due to the fact that you have a lot more cementite in the microstructure. That's the reason, yeah. cementite in the microstructure, um, which is a very hard carbide, hmm? if, if, you, if you didn't know. And, and so, uh, but still you see approximately the same slope um, of about 250 megapascals per um, times square root of uh, microns. Um, uh, increase in the strength as you reduce the, the size. Hmm? All right, so that is important. Now, many, uh, do we actually have steels that look like this, right? Well, well yes, uh, there are many uh, many steels um, uh, are used today which have this, which use this microstructure, uh, perlitic microstructures. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, wire rod uh, cables are, have this microstructure. Um, tire rod uh, has this structure and, and makes use of this uh, refinement to uh, effect to get these very high strengths. You can see the, the strengths here are very high. Um, and so um, where does this strength come from? Hmm? Well, you have, you have two phases here. And so you, you basically have a composite. And it's a composite where you have a very high, um, if you look at the cementite, you have a, a compound, a carbide, which has extremely high uh, strength. And up to now, people have tried to measure what is the strength of cementite. And for instance, if you uh, pull or you compress it, and what you usually find if you, if you take cementite, you make bulk cementite and you try to deform it, it usually breaks. You cannot deform it. Yes? So we don't really know exactly 
what the yield strength is of cementite as a bulk material. Yes? It tends to break, fracture before it plastically deforms. So we kind of think it's probably around 3,000 um, megapascal, 3 gigapascal, or perhaps more. Yeah? And the other phase is, is, uh, is ferrite. And we know very well what, what the, the uh, stress strain curves looks like. It's here, yes. And it's, it's a low strength, uh, relatively low strength uh, phase, yes. So you have a hugely um, uh, strong material and a much softer material. And if you combine them both in this, yes, um, well, you can, you, can, you can get stress strain curves, and um, there's no fracture of the, uh, the cementite in this uh, perlite. Hmm? Even if you give very large uh, deformations, very large strains, for instance, associated with making very thin wires, hmm? you get plastic deformation of the cementite in this case. And the stress strain curves for a typical lamellar perlite, like I showed you in the picture, is, is, is shown here. Hmm? You have a, a, a yield strength around 500, and, and tensile strengths are typically around 1,000 megapascal. Hmm? Okay. So, um, yeah, okay. So, let me say a few more words here. So, um, what we often do um, in, uh, for instance, constructional steels, yes, we will not use. Uh, like we do for wires, for instance, but in construction steel, we'll use um, more or less cementite, excuse me, more or less perlite in the microstructure to change the strength of our steel. Hmm? So, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in a, in a moment, but that's basically what you do. You add carbon, and the carbon it doesn't work in solution or anything. It works to make more, cement, uh, more perlite. And the more perlite you have, the stronger it is. Yes. Um, and that's a traditional way of strengthening structural steels, is by, in fact, adding carbon to make more perlite in the microstructure. And, and you can see, of course, if you have 100% of perlite, um, well, you kind of stuck around the gigapascal strength. And so nowadays, we work very differently. And the reason is when you add carbon to make more perlite, to make your steel stronger, yes, you basically, uh, there are other properties that are not, not so good. Toughness becomes less because the, uh, the, uh, the cementite uh, in, the, uh, in the perlite uh, is not very tough, so it, it will break, it will easily fracture. So toughness is not so good. The other thing which is very important technically is joining. When you, when you have to weld, the presence of large, high amounts of carbon is not a good thing. Yes. So um, as a consequence, um, people have to use other solutions, uh, non-carbon solutions to strengthen steels, and, and so we'll talk about those. Um, as, as we see examples of steels. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have, uh, of course, talked about martensite. We know that in martensite, we have lots of we can we can have lots of carbon in in the martensite because it's a, a, a super saturated solution of carbon. Yes, and there are equations available that will allow you to to calculate the. Uh, the, the yield strength of martensite, if you know the carbon content, yeah, and there are different formulas, and there may be uh, different uh, dependencies on the carbon content. Again, as I've told you, it's not surprising. In fact, if you plot some of these equations, well, this is an equation where the carbon, the strength is proportional to the carbon content. Here it's proportional to the square root of the carbon content. So it's, for, it's a formula for the yield strength as a function of the car and carbon content. And you can see there's not really much difference. Yeah, so you can't really tell whether you have a square root of uh, carbon or a uh, proportional to the carbon content relation between yield strength and carbon content. Um, 
Okay, but but uh, so, so this, these are uh, uh, these equations, and note please that when the concentration of carbon becomes very low in martensite, um, you can make martensite, and it will be harder than ferrite, but it will be relatively soft. Yeah. So what makes martensite strong and hard is not the fact that it's martensitically transformed. What makes it hard and strong and brittle, etc., is the fact that you have carbon in solid solution. So because very often you hear people say, well, martensite is brittle. Martensite is not brittle. Yes? Uh, there's no reason why martensite should be brittle. It's, martensite is the result of a martensitic transformation. Yes? And of course, in certain cases, such as in the case of steels, um, uh, you will have uh, a, a finer microstructure, and you will have dislocation density, which is relatively high, because you, are, you need uh, transformation dislocations, but it's not very hard. Yes, you can see here, um, um, and it's certainly not necessarily brittle. Yes, what makes it brittle is, is, and, and, and hard uh, is, is the fact that you have carbon yes? in solid solution. And you know that this, this, this carbon in solid solution is very um, uh, uh, is very unhappy because it's not the, the, the solubility of carbon in ferrite is zero at room temperature. So very quickly, there will be a tendency for the carbon to move out of the lattice. Yes, and that is the reason why at low carbon levels, yes, we have so little strength. The reason is. Uh, because the microstructure of um, martensite contains what we call lats, yes, so microstructural units, yes, with boundaries, and these lats contain large densities of dislocations, yes, the carbon will readily go to the strain field of the dislocations, yes. And as a consequence, it will stop distorting. Remember this tetragonal distortion I talked about? This tetragonal distortion disappears. And so the, the hardening effect of the carbon is, is limited. Hmm? Yes. Okay. Now, what happens to the um, uh, martensite also is that, um, in particular, in engineering steels, where we have relatively large carbon contents, for instance, 0.4% of carbon, yes, we will um, temper this microstructure. So we will, um, so if the carbon content, say, is 0.4%, yes, we will temper the microstructure and we will obtain um, carbide particles in the microstructure. Find carbide particles. Okay. So, so again, if your carbon content is, is low, less than 0.2 or even lower, um, the carbon will go to your dislocations, yes, and it gives you a soft martensite. If it's higher, for instance, when you're making engineering steels, hmm, what's an engineering steel? Steels, for instance, that you, you uh, use to make uh, camshafts, uh, crankshafts uh, for uh, for, for motors, for instance, or you used to make um, uh, transmissions, um, gears, etc. Um, you, so this is the kind of carbon levels these steels have, 0.4. Right. And so you can, here, you can, um, you find out that in these steels, um, there is also an impact from the distance between the, um, the carbide particles, yeah? 
in tempered martensite. And of course, well, where does this come from, this uh, uh, relation? Well, that basically comes from the, uh, the precipitation strengthening. So, um, and again, you can see here, uh, and it's both for tempered martensite and for bainite, you, should, you can see that the relation, that there is a one over uh, the distance relation. Um, uh, and that, of course, what you want to have is a, uh, a high density of very small particles. And we already know this from uh, the discussion of precipitation strengthening we gave. Uh, uh, carbides uh, are impenetrable particles. They cannot be cut by dislocation. So you need to have high density and very small uh, radii. Then you, you have a strong increase in the strength. Okay, so that's an, another uh, parameter. The lat size also plays a role. Hmm? Lat size being this here, the size of these microstructural units. Yes. And this is some data here showing that the lat size here, the, 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 the increment, the strength increment, due to the lat size is proportional to 1 over the distance, the lat uh, width, excuse me. So it's a kind of a, um, so the, the, the width of these lats here. I do have to say, however, let's go back, that there is an alternative uh, idea which questions this, questions this idea is the following. So the idea that the lats are somehow uh, determining the, the uh, structurally determining the strength of, of the uh, martensite is based on the idea that um, the, 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 the lath boundaries act as very efficient uh, obstacle to the dislocations. And um, so if you, if you look at the microscope picture of lath uh, martensite, that's indeed what uh, you would think. Right? Because you see all these small boundaries, all these narrow laths, and clear, you can clearly see these lath boundaries. The problem is that the misorientation, the misorientation, between these lats is actually very, very, very small. Um, if you do, for instance, a, a diffraction analysis of lat boundary, lat, many lats, it looks like a single crystal. So these lats, lat boundaries are not very good boundaries. They're not really as efficient as real grain boundaries to stop dislocations from moving because there is not much, very, very little misorientation between them. So the, um, in, in, in um, uh, the, the alternative theory is that um, it's the packet size, packet size, which determines uh, the strength of the, the, the Martin site, which is a structural. Um, and so what's the packet size? So when you have original um, uh, austenite grain, yes, the austenite grain will have uh, different, can, can transform to ferrite, and it can be like, as I told you, 24 different variants, yes. Well, um, Groups of variants, yes, will uh, appear together, yes. yes. Uh, when, sh when they share the same, what we call the same one 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 plane, yes, and uh, and so you can readily visualize them. Yes, they all share. They're different variants, 
but they all share the same 111 planes. Yes. So, so you, they form these, these blocks, yes, and, and uh, that you can see, which we call packets, and, and that's uh, clearly the, um, the better unit, structural unit, to um, specify what the, um, what the influences of uh, microstructure on the strength, so the packet size. Right, and we, I'm going to skip things about the stress-strain curves, which you are familiar with. Um, I just want to stop here, because this is a very important graph here, yes? Uh, and I just want to make sure uh, we, we understand each other, yes, uh, with when it comes to strength, okay? There is, of course, when you, uh, in, from your undergraduate education, you know that uh, when things get stronger, yes, they tend to be uh, less plastically uh, formable. They will, you know, something that's hard will be, or strong will be brittle, or you, you won't be able to deform it. That, that's not really true. Uh, of course, in general, if you compare ceramics to metals, yes, it's true. But it's not right. You're not comparing the same things. So if you work in one specific area of materials, uh, like steels, stronger doesn't mean less plastically formable. Hmm? What, what, and the parameter that plays the important, or important role here is the, um, the strain hardening. The strain hardening. Um, so, and this is illustrated here. Um, if you plot the uh, stress strain curve for what's called a high strength IF steel, yes, you find this black line here. Okay. And, um, and if you uh, plot also the uh, strain hardening, yes, and that's very simply just the uh, uh, slope of this line in a true stress, true strain diagram, uh, you know, at one point they will intersect, and that point is the, uh, the point of instability. Mm? Beyond that point, you don't have uniform deformation anymore, yes? And that's a very good measure for plasticity of a steel, yes? So, um, if um, you make this material stronger, yes, without changing the slope of this material, yeah, if I make, so if I have a stress strain curve, yes, and the derivative, yes, and I make exactly the same, say, a material which just has a higher yield strength, yes, with exactly the same slope, you are right. Now the intersection is here, yes, so I will have a stronger material with, it, which, with less formability, with less uh, ability to deform plastically in a uniform manner. But you can tweak, you can tweak um, the strain hardening. You don't have to, uh, uh, keep the, the strain hardening um, uh, the same, yes? You can change it by uh, working on the microstructure. And, and, and we already told you that uh, the way you do this is by storing dislocations and finding ways to store dislocations in the microstructure. And an example here is, for instance, this is a trip steel, yes? It's much stronger. You can see here this one is about 500 megapascal. 
This one is double the strength, double the strength. And um, is it less formable? No, it's le not less formable. It's more, it's more formable. Yeah? So um, by working on the microstructure, you can independently change strength and formability. Hmm? And, and higher strength does not mean um, less formability. I don't know whether it means less formability. It can mean less formability, but it also means more formability. As long if I don't know what the strain hardening is, you know, you can't tell. So, but um, but in steels, um, so you have to be careful um, about this. Um, and, and, and yes, you can get larger uniform elongation and higher strength, no problems, if you tweak the microstructure of your steel and, and you understand the, the mechanical properties, okay? Right. Now, in, in your notes, um, you, you will see that um, there's actually a lot you can already do but with available knowledge. For instance, um, this is a stress strain, an empirical stress strain equation. Let's have a look a few slides back here, which one it is. Uh, it's this one. It's, it's the Swift equation. Yes. It's, it's, it's very similar to what you're used to, the Holloman or the Ludwig equation, but it's the Swift equation. It's, you know, so, so very careful when you um, give data of strain hardening or yield strain or whatever uh, to, to, to say what, to what empirical equation did you fit your data, which is, which is almost never done. Yeah, so, so you always uh, kind of have to guess. But anyway, so um, say you have this Swift equation, empirical equation. So you have parameters A, it should be capital A and capital B. Yes, if you could correct this. Um, uh, there are equations here, uh, empirical equations, based on a, a large amount of uh, data uh, for ferrite, perlite, and martensite, which, which will allow you to actually plot stress strain curves for ferrite, perlite, bainite, and martensite, because uh, the parameter A, the parameter B, and the parameter N have been uh, determined yes, as a function of the most important uh, uh, alloying elements, mm -hmm. uh, silicon, manganese, phosphorus, yeah, and the, the grain size. Yes? There's uh, nothing theoretical about this approach which is a very engineering approach. It works well enough if you, uh, if you need to um, do some research, uh, certainly um, uh, exploring uh, the effect of compositions, etc. It's, it's a good way to, to work because it gives you a stress strain curve, yes, rather than just a yield strength. And, and if you have a stress strain curve, for instance, if um, if you say the plasticity is, pl the plastic strain is zero, uh, that means you can determine the yield strength, yes? Okay. Right, so it's a very, uh, very nice thing to use. And, uh, and, and again, you know, uh, you s the things you see are, are what you expect. For instance, for martensite, the main effect of the uh, the, str of, um, the main effect is, is due to carbon, yes? Whatever the composition is of, of martensite, uh, the, the impact of the carbon overwhelms uh, everything else, okay? Okay. So you can work with this, and if you do this, you, you will uh, be able to plot uh, stress strain curves for various typical compositions. For instance, this, is, this would be for an interstitial free steel, a steel which, which basically contains a few tenths of a percent of um, 
manganese and silicon, and uh, no free carbon. So this, this would be the stress strain curve. Yes. This would be for bainite, yes. Um, and there is martensite, and, and you can see the kind, the, the, the variety of, of strengths you, you have available, yes, uh, when you uh, work with steels, and also the kind of elongations that are available for this, these microstructures. And this kind of um, gives you uh, a range, more a range uh, for ferrite, perlite, um, and uh, martensite um, as a function of the carbon content. And what is interesting hmm, uh, to see is that, um, is, is in fact, the, the, this, this overlap this overlap of properties. For instance, you can, you, you can see here that there is a lot of overlap between martensite and bainite in terms of strength, yes? Um, and, uh, and, and also with bainite and perlite on the lower end of the strength scale, yes? And so um, it also means, yes, that uh, look at the bainite, for instance. The, 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 the property range uh, goes from 100 ppm to 0.8. Yes. And the one for perlite goes from 0.4 to 0.8. Yeah. So the fact that you can make the same mechanical properties with a much lower carbon content using bainite, bainitic microstructure, is actually actively used to make steels with, that are high strength, but also weldable, yeah, with lower carbon contents. Okay, and for instance, um, in one field that's, that's very important lately um, of line pipe steel development, hmm, that those are uh, uh, steels used to make pipes to transport gases or petroleum products, um, there is a, a, a tendency to use bainite instead of perlite in the microstructures. That's one thing. Another example <coughs> is uh, the, the evolution of rail steels. Rail steels are traditionally, just like wire steels, are traditionally perlitic. Yes? Uh, you can make Benetic uh, rails, yes? And that's also an evolution that's happening in certain areas um, uh, where, where we see people uh, using low carbon bainite instead of perlitic microstructures. And that's because you can get the same type of properties and actually a wider range than, uh, than perlite. The reason why we don't see these microstructures as much as, as we could in current technology is because making um, uh, bainite requires um, a different uh, processing, yes, more, a uh, little bit more difficult processing. It, you need to alloy much less, but you need to compensate for the, comp for the loss, the reduction of carbon. So, that means there are lots of, and, and we don't know much about the behavior of bainite in applications. You know? So, and that makes it difficult to introduce some uh, bainitic uh, grades in many applications where it, they would, in principle, be uh, more useful. But anyway, it's an evolution that's coming. Right, so uh, when we have multi-phases, more phases in, in steels, hmm? We can have two extremes of equal st uh, strain deformation or equal stress behavior, yes? Um, and, and in practice, we have a situation somewhere in between. Yeah? And, and this means that um, the harder of the two phases will take on the larger stresses, the softer will take on the higher strains. Yes, okay. 
And this is an example here what, of what happens, for instance, in a, uh, in a um, uh, prolytic uh, microstructure uh, where you have ferrite. Uh, actually, no, this is, this, is, um, this is a steel, excuse me, that contains ferrite and cementite, but not perlite. That's, um, so the, the perlite is formed if you cool down quickly. Yeah? If you cool down a steel with a low carbon content slowly, you will form ferrite grains and cementite particles. Okay? This is the kind of, uh, this is the stress drinker for such a steel, yes? where you don't have perlite but you have cementite. Anyway, the cementite is, has, is this extremely hard phase. Yes, in the microstructure. The ferrite is this one here, is this one. Yeah. The behavior of the steel is somewhere, the actual steel when you do stress, is actually somewhere in between. And if you look at every point in the stress strain curve of the, uh, the, the, the steel, the actual stress and strain in the ferrite is here and the actual stress and strain in the uh, cementite is here. So you have a huge, what we say, partitioning of stress and strain in the microstructure. Eh? And you can see the cementite yes, takes a very much larger load, yes, but the deformation is, the strain on the cementite is very small. So. And, and so that means that even though the cementite is a brittle compound, yes, because most of the deformation is done by the ferrite matrix, it takes a long, um, it takes uh, uh, quite some deformation, quite a straining before the cementite particles actually break, yes. Although, although the if you take the cementite separately and you would try to, to, to deform it, it would almost break instantly. It couldn't plastically deform. In the composite, it's different. Hmm? So that's why, you know, if you wonder why in perlite you got, you know, you, you're pulling perlite, why doesn't it instantly break? Because the cementite is so brittle. That's because of this phenomenon. You get partitioning, okay? Um, another um, nice example of steel with um, uh, the um, what was measurements of um, partitioning has been done. So it's a duplex stainless steel, contains 50% austenite and 50% ferrite. It's highly alloyed steel. Again, you can see that the, the actual stress strain for, for a, a certain point on the stress strain curve of, of the steel, the macroscopic stress strain curve, there is a partitioning between the stress and the strain, between the hard, harder ferrite and the softer austenite. And you see the ferrite will have a higher stress and less strain, and the austenite will have a higher uh, strain and less stress, okay? Some more on uh, the uh, multi-phase steel behavior. So uh, so this is Martensite stress strain curve, yes? And this is ferrite stress strain curve, yeah? So, and you can make steels, which we call DP steels, where you have microstructures which contain ferrite and then some martensite particles also in the microstructure. Yeah? And it's possible, as, as, you, as we've discussed, I think, already, to introduce martensite in the microstructure okay. and change the amount of martensite. So if I start with a microstructure that's fully ferritic, the stress strain curve will be this one, yes? And if it's fully martensitic, it will be here. 
But by changing the volume fraction of martensite, I can basically vary, have different stress strain curves, yes? So um, if I measure, for instance, the tensile strength, the tensile strength, yeah. say that this is the tensile strength here, yes? I will see that the more I ha add martensite, the higher it becomes. And in practice, this relation is uh, almost linear. So the amount of martensite, if you plot the amount of martensite, volume fraction of martensite in the x-axis for DP steel, and you measure the tensile strength, you'll see that there is a linear relation between the tensile strength and the volume fraction of um, uh, martensite. And, and so you can make basically a, uh, a DP steel with, say, a tensile strength of 500, and you can go up to 1,000. Yes, so that's, that's quite a variety, quite a range of strengths that you have there to play with, yes? Okay. All right, so, so I, I, I'm not going to discuss the, um, the, the formability issues. You, you can just read it, and some of the aspects we've already discussed. Um, There is um, this graph here that I, I think is important, which I, I want you to uh, definitely have a look at, um, is that um, we were talking, uh, remember, about reduced grain sizes in um, reduction of grain sizes in um, in steels, and how, when you reduced the the grain size, you would um, also decrease formability. So, and this is an example of the way you can look uh, to this. So you know that if you plot the stress strain curve of a steel, and you plot the derivative, yes, where the derivative is equal to the stress, right? That is the point of uniform elongation, and that's a measure for plastic formability. If you increase, excuse me, if you uh, decrease the grain size, you basically move, yes, this stress strain curve upward, yes. And, um, Yes, and so you end up with a smaller uniform elongation. Yes, and of course, if you continue doing this, yes, you can see that uh, yes, you will be able to achieve a lot of strength, but you will not be able to achieve a lot of um, uh, formability. So, and um, so you remember that if you, if you plot the strength or the, the tensile strength as a function of one over the root, yes, it goes like this. Hmm? And actually, when you plot the, the tensile strength, the, the slope is slightly lower, yes? So, so, so uh, what, I, what I show here is, is actually correct. You, know, you cannot increase the, um, so, so the reduction of the grain size doesn't allow you, doesn't give you a possibilities to increase the, the strain hardening. Hmm? So the strain hardening um, is, um, is actually, uh, as you increase the, the strength through um, uh, Get to, to reduction of the grain size is actually it get, actually gets lower, and so it's actually worse than here. Okay, but that's an important point. Um, in general, steels 
which tend to be single phase or mostly single phase ferritic steels, yes? We will indeed see that when you increase the tensile strength, you will see a reduction in the strain hardening, yes? And you can measure this. The engineering approach to measuring strain hardening is looking at the N value, yes? The N value from the Holomon equation. That's what happens, okay? That's, bec but that's because an interstitial free steel, a low carbon steel, a solution strengthened steel, or a structural steel, or an azole steel, they're basically mainly ferritic steels, yes? So, um, so if you want to increase the, uh, the strain hardening, you have to work on the microstructure. Okay. So we won't discuss hardness here and fracture. Yes, uh, perhaps um, a word about fracture here, just, just so we understand each other if there is a... Uh, when when you, you have your a sample, that steel sample that you test, yeah? so uh, what happens beyond the uh, the UTS? Yes, uh, is not unimportant. Yes, uh, in in certain application. It is totally unimportant to a certain extent. Yeah. For instance, um, there are many applications where you, you never strain the material beyond 10, 20% or something like this. So, so you're never close to necking, yes? Um, for instance, when you make car bodies, you never deform the material so that you get non-uniform necking uh, because obviously uh, you don't want the part to look like this, yes? Okay, so you, you, in, in, in many applications, the only forming that you do is within the uniform straining range, yes? Okay, so anyway, but you test the material and, and um, but having said this, there are many steels that, you know, you can strain even beyond the, uh, the UTS a lot. For instance, IF steels, you can still strain 15% or more beyond the uniform necking. And so you get a lot of the, 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 um, the, the necking region is very high. Hmm? Okay? So, uh, so you get the diffuse necking. So th this diffuse necking is related to the creation of internal defects. Yes? So why, why do you get suddenly a, 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 a diffuse necking? Yes? And so this diffuse neck, that, that's this, this shape change here, it, that's, not, that's not the same as this localized neck, yes? Which occurs because of mechanical reasons, yes? This diffuse necking is related to the uh, to the fact that you, you've created internal voids in your sample, yes? And, and that, uh, well, at, at certain place, um, you get an increase in the strain rate and then all the uh, deformation is localized here. So as soon as this occurs, by the way, yes, it means that all this, the rest of the sample here stops deforming, yes? Stops, no more deformation. So uh, that means that um, when you're doing research and you have a broken sample, this area here, yes, and this area in the, yes, is actually very different, yes? So if, if you look at the stress-strain curve, elastic part and this, yes, and this is the UTS, yes, this sample here has the microstructure at the UTS. Yes, and this microstructure here is the sample here. Yes, so it's a very different microstructure. Yeah, so and I often see this, in, and and then also if you're doing your samples carefully, 
here, the microstructure is here, yes? So a single specimen can tell you a lot of things, yes? Mm -hmm. And very often I see uh, um, uh, students not making use of this fact that you have a lot of information on one sample just in, in terms of microstructure uh, in particular. Hmm? Because a broken sample actually has information, has a lot of information diff of the sample at different stages. Yeah? The, um, and, and so if you were to look at your material um, here, when just beyond the UTS, this is what you would see. You'd see um, grain boundaries where you have formed h holes, or here an inclusion and around the inclusion is a void. Or here, this is a perlite in ferrite. You see here voids at the perlite ferrite interface. Yes? So voids are, and, and the ability to create voids, yes, in the microstructure actually determine what my uniform elongation is to a large extent from a microstructural point of view. And actually, if you plot the, 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 the so if, if, you, if you make bars, uh, tensile bars, and you look at the area reduction in the tensile test, yes, and you do this as a function of the percentage of cementite in your microstructure, you see a very strong relation, yes? The more you have particles that will give you, that will allow you to nucleate voids in the microstructure, the lower your formability will be. The, 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 the quicker you will start having um, diffuse necking in your material. So cav what, what the, these are called cavity nucleation second phases have a very strong impact on ductility. Yes? And in particular, the necking. Yes? So, so um, you can improve things. You can improve, that's why you, it's important to, um, when you uh, design steels or in practice uh, to um, make sure that internal cleanliness of your steel is very high so that you don't have unnecessary sulfide or non-metallic inclusions in your steel because they will also impact your properties because hmm? all these 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 non-metallic inclusions these carbides etc that that are not necessary will uh, very often act as uh, cavity nucleating uh, effects uh, um, uh, inclusions on the um, uh, during the straining, okay? And th the same holds with, uh, you know, very hard phases such as martensite. You know, this is, for instance, martensite in a, in a, in a austenite. This is an austenite matrix, and here we have some martensite in it you can see that it's a very high carbon martensite, by the way, so it's very brittle. Yes. Uh, you can see that uh, in this case, um, you don't have uh, uh, cavity nucleation, but when the martensite fractures, it creates a lot of cracking that goes into the, uh, the austenite also. So, okay. Yes, and you're familiar with the... Um, um, the Sharpie test. Hmm? Again, I, I want to stress you, because we'll, we'll come back to that when we discuss some uh, structural steels, is the ferritic steels, for instance, this is a ferritic steel, 1% of manganese, a binary uh, st uh, steel. You've got this incredibly sharp drop in, uh, in uh, the 
um, absorbed energy and it's usually associated with brittle transgranular fracture this yes uh, type of behavior um, that is due to the dislocations yes the dislocations which have uh, the screw dislocations which have such low mobility because you don't have this effect in the austenite yes in austenite you have much lower uh, uh, pearls uh, stresses so the, the, the screw dislocations are not subject to these very hot, strong um, uh, pearls valleys so you don't get that there is a decrease yes but it's it's never that uh, strong okay good so we have said that in relation to this uh, uh, ductile to brittle transformation that uh, grain size reduction is very positive yes so if we plot the yield strength as a function of the inverse square root of the grain size we see that on top there we see an increase in our yield strength so the material becomes strong we know this yes um, if I plot the ductile to brittle transition temperature, so where there is a sharp decline in the, um, uh, the absorbed energy in the Sharpie test, I see that uh, the, um, when I uh, reduce the grain size, I have a drop in, the, um, um, in this transition temperature. And what is very uh, important here yes, is that if you use a conventional way, a conventional steel, uh, a, a perlite ferrite with a perlite ferrite microstructure, yes, you can only go up to here in terms of properties. You can, you, can, you can reduce the grain size, yes, but you cannot reduce it as much as in an HSLA steel. So you remember these are steels where you add niobium, yes, and it allows you to reduce the grain size considerably. Yeah? And so this is what the niobium uh, additions and the, uh, the processing of these uh, uh, niobium steels allows you to do is a reduction of the grain size from 10 to about five or six yes, and you get an additional increase in strength and reduction in ductile to brittle transformation temperature you, you you of course do lose elongations however in the applications <coughs> where we use <coughs> TMCP uh, niobium alloyed uh, steels we don't need very high elongations Yes. When you make um, uh, line pipe, you don't have huge elongations. Yes. Uh, uh, when you make uh, steel plates for uh, offshore, same thing. You, know, you basically do not deform them very much. Um, if you um, use these plates to make uh, for shipbuilding, same thing. Right? So these are not, uh, so, so you can live with the loss of and it's not a very huge loss, but you can live with the loss, the slight loss in uniform elongation hmm? when you reduce the grain size. Because you have uh, three big advantages. You, you ink more strength, yes, uh, more toughness, yes, and better weldability, yes. And weldability is something that's very essential um, in, uh, for offshore shipbuilding and line pipes. Okay. So I, again, um, 
with the, uh, these transition temperatures, so we know we can improve things with, um, with um, uh, additions, with, with reduction, sorry, of the grain size, there are certain additions uh, which will work the other way. Hmm? And in particular, phosphorus. Hmm? Phosphorus will increase the, uh, the, the transition, uh, ductile brittle transition temperature, uh, a lot. Yes? So this is pure iron. Yes? Uh, ductile brittle transition temperature is around 50, 40, 50. Yeah. Um, if you add phosphorus, it increases. 0 0.2, 0 0.6, you, you're, so people will not use phosphorus, okay? And, um, and that's why, why in, big, uh, you know, in, in, in steel making, yeah, iron and steel making, phosphorus removal is so important, yes? So uh, sulfur removal is important, but phosphorus is, 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 is very important because it's difficult. Yeah. It's difficult to go lower than 100 ppm. So, uh, but it's very important to, to get as low as possible. Hmm? Uh, right, so phosphorus, um, in many applications, you will not use it. Uh, because the ductile brittle temperature goes up. So, and, and, you know, and you remember that was our best solid solution hardener in ferritic steels. Yes? So um, it's very sad, but you can't use it. Uh, for silicon, that was the second best one. So um, the trouble is uh, this. You, you get the same effect as you increase the amount of silicon you uh, increase the ductile to brittle transition temperature, and, and that's, uh, of course, a big problem. However, you will note that at lower amounts of silicon, there is actually a decrease. Yeah? So people will add up to half a percent of silicon, also in constructional steels, knowing that it has no negative impact. Yes? And, and that you can use, of course, uh, even a half a percent of silicon will give you 50, 60 megapascal of strength, yes? So um, it's something that, you know, uh, is nice to have, okay? So, uh, but um, th there are uh, maybe uh, uh, some of, uh, people um, in the, here that um, are interested in s developing steels which contain larger amounts of silicon because, as you know, uh, silicon is a very interesting element in connection to bainitic steels to suppress carbide formation, yes? And so there, you know, it's, um, you want to have silicon contents which are in the range on around 1.5 to have this um, silicon work effect effectively as suppressant. So that's a little bit of a, a delicate uh, choice to make, and, um, but, and very little is known about this, this level of, uh, of silicon in, in, in um, st steels for structural applications. But it's, um, it's, um, um, it's, it's a silicon level that is acceptable in certain cases, such as, uh, in automotive applications. You know that, uh, and the, the reason is the following, when, when you test for ductile to brittle transitions with a, uh, a Sharpie test, uh, you're thinking of thick uh, uh, gauge materials. You're thinking about uh, millimeters thick uh, plate, for instance, yes? And so when you test them with the Sharpie test, you test at very high strain rates in plain strain conditions, as we say. Yeah, so, so, uh, and, and, and so that those are very hard mechanical conditions and high strain rate and low temperatures, yes? In sheet material, yes, 
because it's much thinner, yes, it's more difficult to uh, obtain uh, plain strain condition, testing conditions. So even if the material is more brittle, yes, it will not actually behave so badly as a, if it was thick material. Hmm? So this is also something you have to realize. But anyway, for, for many applications, or structural applications in gas and petroleum industry, silicon, and, you know, um, not higher than um, half a percent typically. And what happens if you have 3% of silicon or even more? Are there situations where we have this much? Yes, electrical steels. Electrical steels uh, have these very high silicon levels. And it turns out that this material, these materials are indeed very brittle, yes? And uh, there are cases where uh, at this level of silicon, the slabs, you know, the material as cast will just break, will just fracture in a brittle fashion, just under the influence of its own weight. Yeah? So, 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 so silicon is very sensitive in, um, to people in, uh, in iron and steel making, because yeah? they have to uh, clean up afterwards. Manganese, uh, I said, so manganese here, zero manganese, half a percent manganese, uh, you get a decrease in the ductile to brittle transition temperature and an increase in the absorbed energy. So, so manganese is always good, yes, always good uh, to use. What about carbon? Well, carbon, it's a mixed message here. Okay, what you see in general with carbon is as you go from very low carbon, so uh, 10 to the minus 3 means 0.003 yes, so that is 30 ppm of carbon 30 ppm of carbon, so 30 ppm of carbon I see that if I increase the carbon a little bit excuse me, if I increase the carbon I see a decrease in the ductile to brittle transformation, transition temperature, yes? And this continues up to around 10 to the minus 2. So that's 0 0.01, yes? After that, I see an increase. By the way, these are different curves because they're different phosphorus contents. And so you can see here, again, that the more phosphorus you add, the, the, the worse it gets. But um, this is important. Why does it increase here, and why does it decrease here? Yes? Well, it's very simple. As long as carbon is in solid solution, solid solution, in the ferrite, yes, or in solution in the ferrite, yes, it will have a positive effect on the ductile to brittle transition temperature. As soon as you form cementite particles in the microstructure, so that's at around the maximum solubility of carbon in ferrite, so that's about uh, 200 ppm, so around uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.02 um, mass percent, you form cementite in the microstructure and you get uh, worsening of the uh, an increase of the ductile to brittle transition temperature. So why does the carbon um, have a, in solution have a positive impact? Well, the, the, in, at these very low contents of carbon in ferrite, the carbon tends to go to the few dislocations that are available and the grain boundaries. Yes. And in the grain boundaries, it's a doc well documented fact that carbon increases the grain boundary cohesion. Yes? And that, that's how uh, we explain the reason why the carbon uh, improves the uh, uh, ductile to brittle transition temperature. Hmm? So, so so carbon and manganese 
Um, so, so manganese always improves things, yes? And carbon also improves things as long as carbon is, is in solution. And you can learn a lot from looking at the, um, the, 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 the fracture surfaces in, in ductile to brittle transformation, uh, whether it's, it's some cleavage type of fracture or whether you have intergranular fracture or whether you have what, what uh, we describe as dimples, yes? And the dimples are nothing else than um, these voids that you form in the ins inner voids that you form that uh, fracture. Hmm? And, and then usually these dimples will contain the nucleation site, a little particle uh, that's inside the matrix and which has caused the void formation and, and then finally the, the, the breakage of this, this, uh, this void. Hmm? All right. So... Okay, and I, I won't be talking about fatigue. Uh, there is a separate course on this, and I will, I will stop uh, now anyway, okay? And then we will um, 